In high pop, we write mostly in Scala and Kotlin, as you may see. And in my team, all the code is written in Scala. I am the part of employee data team that is responsible for employee settings and data management of the employees. I've been writing in Scala for almost five years, I think, and uh, almost two of them here at Hybo. As you have already guessed, uh, looking at uh, what we are doing at, uh, in a template data team, we've got enough complex data structures here because uh, actually we manage everything that is relevant to employee metadata and uh, the data that is saved in employee's profile, uh, that is saved in employee's directory, uh, importing data and so on. And Usually, I think, where is uh, actually the complex data structures, uh, the Scala uh, mesh patterns usually come to help. Uh, let's look at this slide. I think everyone actually knows what, what you see here. It's pretty straightforward and sim uh, simple. Uh, raise your hand if you have used pattern matching before, Scala pattern matching. Okay, almost everyone, and it, uh, there's no brainer, you know, pattern matching is the second most widely uh, feature used in Scala after function values and closures. And by the way, in Hypo, we use sometimes to combine, not sometimes, we used to combine at all two most uh, popular Scala features, uh, actually to write uh, pattern matching inside uh, the closures. And uh, this is the real, code from one of our modules, this is a real chunk. Uh, I hope our security officer will not call me now, but <laughs> I'm showing it here. But uh, don't try to understand what you see here, because it, it looks pretty bloated without the context. What I'm trying to say, you can't be a Scala developer and say that you've never used pattern matching. That's what I think. So, Fun fact, Scala is the only mainstream imperative language that fully adopted the power of pattern matching. That's why Scala code looks clear and neat. And historically it came because, you know, like the most mainstream languages are around object-oriented programming. And Scala combines both functional programming and object-oriented programming. And uh, in my opinion, uh, this animal that we use nowadays is pretty lovely. So, yeah. Let's move on to pattern matching. Uh, what you see now is actually a type pattern. Scala is a type language and it makes it easy to match objects against type patterns. Also pretty easy and straightforward. You get some input and you match that it's a string, you handle it. You match that this is an integer, you handle it and so on. I mean, uh, there is nothing to talk about it. The power of inheritance to perform pattern matching is presented by case classes. It is called constructor matching, meaning that the constructor is used in this case to make the match possible. So you see there is abstract class vehicle, and you see two case classes with different constructors, for example, bus, where we def define the manufacturer and the model, and car that could be also electric. For example, just assume that in some reason bus can't be electric here. So that's why this pattern I mentioned works perfectly to understand uh, where is the car and where is the bus and to handle each of them uh, properly. Uh, the same result could be achieved for tuples too. So here's the tuple pattern matching. As you may see, uh, tuples are objects containing a limited number of sub-objects. Like here, instead of case class, we see uh, tuple. Actually, it's a three tuple. Manufacturer, model, electric, and the second one, manufacturer and model. And we also can match these tuples and to handle properly uh, the values inside of the tuples. Uh, we can imagine uh, those tuples as collections of mixed elements and each collection has a limited size. So if we can imagine like this, I mean it's safe to say that uh, uh, we can also uh, use pattern matching for collections. So these are where the things are coming more, more interesting in my opinion. Uh, this is the sequence pattern. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to understand what is what exactly uh, going on here and I think uh, one of the most interesting is the first case close. Uh, as you see we've used LSX to define the single element of the list. Uh, 
And in order to match an unknown number of elements, for example, zero numbers, one number, or even more, we'll use uh, the star wildcard, as you may see here. In the other case clauses, we're simply ignoring the values uh, by using the underscore character, as you may see in uh, case clause number two and number three. So this is how sequence uh, pattern matching works. Depending on our needs, this is not the only way how we can write it. And we can change it a little bit and to write something like this. As you see in the first clause, we still define uh, the matching by single element of the sequence, uh, but define it a little bit differently. Also, here, uh, an advantage is that we can define the last element of the sequence by using the underscore and lsx. So x actually is uh, the last element of our sequence. In my opinion, this is already a pretty fancy pattern that you don't see every day, but could be very useful in some specific situations. And sometimes even this fancy pattern could look even more differently. As you may see, the syntax is changed. Uh, we use, uh, I, I saw it many times in other code, uh, we use column column, and we get the same result like we got in both previous uh, sequence patterns. We pattern on a single element uh, of the sequence. Uh, the only question here is probably, um, do you like this syntax? Do you feel comfortable of reading this column column? Um, I think you have, you have something to choose, you know, uh, around these three uh, sequence patterns, what, what works the best for you. I personally think that if, for example, in your code performance is not the king and you don't need to write the most efficient code as possible, there is always uh, a space uh, to step back a little bit. If just every time when I look at my code, I think if I can step, step back and probably make it a little bit less efficient, but more readable, if efficiency is not uh, the most important thing in it. So let's move on. Uh, another interesting pattern that I would like you to show that uh, it's, uh, we're going to use regular expressions when matching objects in uh, our match expressions. Uh, I tried to make it as simple as possible, so it's, uh, it will be pretty straightforward that uh, we can match number, letter, or even both if we want uh, by using regular expressions. The only thing that I would love to add here is just imagine if, if it was a real code and how complex could be the regular expression there and uh, how ugly it can look the code without pattern matching in this case. So probably this is something that is not widely used, but I also use it a couple of times and, and it really does the job and uh, it makes the code to be more neat. Uh, you can also gracefully open Scala options by using pattern matching. In my opinion, this is one of the most important use cases. Sometimes you don't want to use uh, the functions and you can do it this way. Uh, pretty straightforward. If your option is not empty, use this value. It's already not wrapped as an option. It's a real string. Yeah, it's string in this case, I see it. Or, for example, handle the case when it's, uh, it's empty. Another use case is less popular, but could be very useful in some other situation. You can bind a variable to either a full or partial match results. Uh, so what's going on here? If you remember our case class from one of the previous uh, patterns that uh, I showed, that was a case class car that had three members. One of them was manufacturer, another was model, the third one was electric, which was boolean to define if the car is electric or not. And in this case, what's going on? In this case, the, the, mo the first case close is the most interesting because the variable C, you see at, and then your case class, the variable C uh, is assigned to any electric car, as you see, uh, in the first case clause, we match on those cars only when electric is true. Similarly, we can bind a partial uh, on a match, uh, uh, a partial, uh, we can bind on a part of a match object to variable, 
you can see in this code. Uh, what's the difference here? Also, let's look at the first clause. The difference that we don't want to assign a variable to electric car, we want to collect all Tesla cars, like specific electric cars. Are there any Tesla drivers here, maybe? Okay. Uh, so, as you may see, in the first case, we will collect only electric vehicle, electric cars, and in the second case, we will collect specific electric cars, which is also could be pretty useful. Okay, still, in my opinion, it's pretty obvious that all this magic is around the case classes, as we see, and we know that there is no problem to match the case classes. But what about the situation when we need to match the class? and not the case class. Uh, the extractors are here to help us. Let's say we've got a class employee, the first one. I, I just want to know this is not uh, real Bob's <laughs> code. This is not a real employee from our system. Uh, so we have a class employee. Uh, extractor objects are objects containing a method called unapply. And in case classes, you get an apply method out of the box, you don't see. Like, every time when you create a case class, you get both apply and unapply out of the box. But if it's a class employee, for example, you need to define your custom and apply in order to be able to match it. And this method is executed when matching against the pattern is successfully. So we can see what's going on here, employee match. Then this match uses the unapply inside of our object, and this way we can match on the class. The coolest thing about it is that you can match, you can match classes, of course, but also you can do matching on some specific parameters of the class, rather than doing on the entire class. What I mean, just imagine that there is an employee, I, as you see, I have amended it a little bit, and I have this employee ID, just say, I know, his, his real ID, the passport number, whatever. And we don't want to expose this ID, we don't need it. We want to match only on his name and age. This is how defining uh, an apply method properly in this case, without ID, can help us to match only on the, uh, on some specific parameters of the class employee. As you see, we match only on name and age. I think this is probably one of the most powerful things that Unapply gives us. So you don't need to take all the class with you every time. And actually, you know, like, redund use redundant members to use them as a tail in your code. And this looks a, bit, a little bit crazy in my opinion, because if we rename our companion object, the pattern matching will still work. As you see, in the code before, it looked like that's what a companion object of employee. But here, we see, we, we, remove it, we rename it to employee pattern, and it still works. This happens because when the runtime does pattern matching, it recognizes the pattern employee pattern with a name and age. The pattern is defined in an object with an apply function, and it's enough uh, because it returns a tuple with string and integer. So, uh, runtime checks if the option is not empty, and the pattern actually matches, and the composed value are used uh, then in your expression functions, whatever, whatever goes after. But let's assume there is some logic inside the unapply function. Uh, for example, the option is not empty only for employees older than 21 years old. Uh, don't ask me why. Uh, there could be a reason to put uh, some logic to an apply method, but sometimes you have, you have no other choice than to implement it this way. And what will happen in our case, we have this extractor pattern matching, and it's not exhausted, so we don't handle with a wild card uh, all the cases that are not employee of, uh, that has a, a name and age. So, in this case, for example, if an employee is just 18 years old, our pattern match will throw match case error on the runtime. And this is the biggest problem. So, this is a good reason to think twice if you want to define some logic inside an apply method or not. Uh, I wouldn't do it, because the good practice is to move this logic to pattern itself. 
We can use pattern guards to achieve this behavior. Pattern guards are Boolean expressions, as you see, inside the pattern matching itself. Uh, and all these Boolean expressions used together on the same level as the case clause. So it's not only we match on class employee, we also check if an employee is younger than 21, uh, we define him as a student, and if an employee is older than 65, we define him, for example, as a senior citizen, and so on. But it, I mean, it solves our problem. Uh, guards are pretty popular in Scala, but there is one problem with guards. Uh, do you know, maybe someone can guess what the problem with guards? Yes? You can actually edit here, but I think there's another problem. The problem is that it looks ugly. Do you agree with me? I mean, a lot of cases, a lot of ifs. Uh, is there any neat way to write, to write it, to make this code uh, uh, does its job? Yes, it is. You can create an object for each condition. For example, we define an object student with its own and apply method. Do you remember, I told you that actually an object that defines an apply method shouldn't be connected to, to the class itself when we rename it. So this is where we can use this magic. We, connect, we, we create an object student with its own apply method. Uh, it returns boolean if uh, employee is older than 21. And we do the same in the same fashion with another object. We create object senior uh, with an apply method that returns the boolean and checks if an employee is older than 65. And look at this code. I mean, we can really feel the difference here. It's more readable, it's more neat. Someone that even don't work in your scope, in your team, and need to write something, he can understand at least what's going on here in this code. But the most interesting thing is probably how does it work behind the scenes? Uh, I got an answer, and it's a pretty short answer. This is how it works behind the scenes. I think that this is a perfect illustration of it. Uh, actually, Scala Mage is a Java switch on steroids. This is how, we, how I, would, I would say about it. Some Scala Mage statements can be compiled to the same bytecode as Java switch statements. Of course, it's relevant for more, for more, simple, for more simple patterns, like we've seen in the beginning. Uh, but for most cases, especially complex one, as we've just seen, uh, that use an apply method, it will be compiled to the same bytecode as a series of ill if-else statements. Uh, I want to show you something, just, just look at these code chunks. I intentionally made these code chunks to be so small so you won't see anything, because I don't want you to read it now and to understand what's going on here. I just want uh, it to be a kind of a visual representation of uh, how, how strong uh, Scala uh, match pattern feature is, because it hides all this Java boilerplate behind the neat and elegant code uh, that you've just seen. What about time complexity? This is also an interesting question. And in my opinion, it's safe, it's safe to say, and it's safe to call them constant operations, but in fact, it's a linear. Anyway, since the maximum number of checks will not change uh, for the input, and let's be real, how many case, cases can you have inside one, one uh, match pattern? How many cases? Three, 10? So I believe we can say it's uh, all one complexity and despite that uh, pattern matching is a powerful tool, it's very easy to start abusing it. So I want to show you something. This is the code that I've seen many times. Uh, there is no such code in Bob, I, I should tell you. We usually don't try to abuse uh, uh, different Scala features. But uh, I will tell you a short story. Once I worked with one guy from Berlin on some interesting project. Uh, the module was written in Scala. The guy from Berlin was a real genius. I mean, he even looked like a genius. You know, very, very nice guy when he speaks, and you understand that he's really clever, and you want to spend time with him, but he looks completely like a homeless. I mean, his t-shirt, 
his shoes and everything. And, and he was so into Scala programming and he was really obsessed with pattern matching. That was his weak place. I mean, I learned a lot of patterns that I showed you today from him, but on another hand, I saw this code more than once when he was using pattern matching, he was writing this code. In my opinion, this code is absolutely legit and it does the job, but it's not neat, it's hard to read, it looks bloated, and trust me, when someone that doesn't know what exactly is going on here, but he needs to add something, he will not rewrite this function. Probably he will add more nested cases here. So, as, as, uh, as you know, as it said, don't try to do it at home. Okay, but what about this one? Uh, this is the question that I would like to ask you. Uh, do you think that it's an abuse? I, I will explain. You, you can write it as if condition, do something else, do something else, in a classic way. But some people write it this way. If you think that this is an abuse, raise your hand, please. Okay, so it's like half-half. Uh, it's interesting that uh, during my five years uh, writing in Scala, I always see two camps. <laughs> some people like to write if else, and some people use uh, this pattern matching. Uh, okay, but I think it depends on situation. Let me explain. For example, there is a need to send an argument, a higher order function, that receives a Boolean value using Scala's partial function syntax, something like this. I think now it looks more legit. What do you think? Okay. In any other cases, in my opinion, if we look at this, this is the matter of taste. Because anyway, as we have seen before, uh, it's always if else behind the scenes. So it doesn't really matter. It's, if you think it's more readable, you may use it. Uh, if you think if else is more readable, you can also use it. Do you remember the piece of real code? The real pop code that uh, I showed you in the beginning, uh, that was closure using uh, the pattern matching inside. Uh, this is this is a more simple example of how two most popular Scala features are used together: closures and pattern matching. This is not the code that I showed in the beginning. Uh, this is a more simple example. So at least you may understand what's going on here. Uh, I like to write it this way because you have a list and you need to collect only those elements of the list that are less than 10. I think uh, it's pretty straightforward and, uh, and it looks cool. Pattern matching uh, inside closures is one of the most useful use cases of pattern matching in my opinion. But there is one more use case uh, that I also think it's pretty useful but I don't see a lot. It's using it inside uh, try-catch blocks with alternatives. Just imagine we have a code like this. We have do something function that can throw, but we want only, it's not even we want, let's say we take care only about uh, these types of exceptions. Illegal argument exception and illegal state exception. And we handle them properly. Whatever else happens, uh, it, it, it's not our job. We don't want to think about it. So in this case, uh, you use pattern match inside try catch, and you also uh, use this syntax to make it with alternatives. Of course, you can separate it if you need a separate handling of the error, but you know, it's, it, it, it's more similar to what we've already seen today. Uh, of course, you can do even more things with Scala pattern matching. Anyway, in my opinion, any new type of pattern matching will probably uh, be derived from any of those uh, that uh, we've discussed today. Uh, it's a powerful Scala tool, we often use it in high wolf. And of course there are more interesting things you may find in our code, thanks Scala capabilities. And if you want to see more, to see it with your own eyes, we're hiring, come join us. Thank you for listening, I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for watching.